your sales reps are no longer the channel to your customer. They are a channel to your customer. And, and that's true at any point in a buying journey, of early, middle, or late. And so I think the better thing to think about is not so much what do I need to do to make my sellers better or what do I need to do to make my website better, but rather how can I, irrespective of a channel, human or digital, solve for customers' perceptions of themselves and their confidence that they're aligned around objectives, tactics, metrics, targets, and timelines. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is someone known to have the biggest crystal ball in B2B sales, a researcher, author, and thinker with a passion for productive disruption. He's a co-author of the best-selling industry changing The Challenger Sale and The Challenger Customer, formerly chief storyteller for CBE, now Gartner, and from 2003 to 20, 2022. Now the global head of research, advisory, and communities at Ecosystems, the insightful, energetic, and irreverently engaging Brent Adamson. There it is. How there are you, go. Tim? Do you have an at-bat yeah. song too? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I got to the crystal ball line, which is actually funny because you, you're a marketing guy. You'll appreciate yeah. this. Um, you, I think you said known for. What would you say before crystal ball, like known for or something like that? Yeah, someone known to have. Known to have. All right. So basically where that line came from, is one person put it on a comment to one of my posts on LinkedIn two years ago, and I thought it was kind of clever. So I threw it in my bio, and now I'm known to have that. So I just thought, see, that's that's how these things work. It's all it's all a house of cards, Tim. <laughs> I, I, I love it, but it's an endorsement, right? So you can actually say that, hey, I didn't Yeah, say but that. I guess what I'm saying is it's kind of a self-endorsement only because I am, I am the amplification. So I don't know if that counts, but anyway. <laughs> oh, well, you know, we'll put it to the test today because my first question, you oh, God. Been for right. over 20 years in, in B2B sales, marketing, all the revenue team functions. Yep. Right now, today, as we sit here, what is the biggest challenge facing revenue teams? Oh, man, it's it's the same challenge as faced revenue teams for the last ever, which uh -huh. is, and I say this, by the way, I say, uh, so to your point about irreverent, yeah. I actually have a lot of respect for people in the commercial profession, sales, marketing, success, all of it, because it's hard. It's just, it's, yeah. it's hard. Right. But, but that said, nonetheless, somewhat tongue in cheek, quote, but simultaneously quite seriously, I think the biggest challenge is this can't get out of their own way. Right. The, the, there, there's this, uh, you tell me, but I, it, <laughs> there is an ongoing and consistent and almost, it seems unavoidable, deep set, almost human need in sales and marketing and commercial functions to tell the world about us, right? It's like, 100%. well, they, they, did, they didn't buy from us, so they don't understand what we do. They don't, they didn't pay us a premium, so they don't understand our value proposition. Or I'm, I, I you know, I, I wasn't convincing enough, so I'm not their trusted advisor. We're constantly solving in sales and marketing for customers' perceptions of us as a company, as a brand, as a product, as a feature set, as a human being, as a seller, as a trusted advisor. And I think, so that would be maybe, if you will, the negative side of your question. The positive side yeah. is I think the opportunity is for us to is to focus a little less on solving for customers' perceptions of us and focus more on customers' perceptions of themselves. Because I think not only will that differentiate you, it's also where there is most need for help and change. It goes into making a customer a buyer. I know you talk about this often. Feel yeah. confident, right? Yeah. So so this is I see it right. So it, I I kind of led the witness with my so, right. But yes, yeah. right. So that's this is. Oh man, I, this stuff is so interesting, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, we got on this track uh, at CEB right before we got acquired by Gartner. And then we we continue to study it a lot at Gartner. I continue to work with it today because I just find it utterly fascinating is that, you know, all the different ways over the many years and all the amazing research uh, teams and researchers that I've worked with, um, we've, we've been 
over those years and over those companies, we've tested a whole series of hypotheses around what drives up the likelihood of customers buying what we used to call a high quality, low regret deal. So that is a, a, a bigger deal with the broader scope that maybe the higher price point, the solutions kind of deals that we're all looking to sell. And how do we get them to buy that kind of deal while simultaneously feeling good about it and good about themselves at the same time? So usually large complex deals come with higher levels of buyer remorse and regret and all sorts of bad mojo, right? So we want to, yeah. we're looking for the unicorn, big deal, feel great. Okay. So we've we've built all sorts of statistical models and Hank Barnes and friends of mine over at Gartner still do this today um, mm-hmm. around what are the different things that need to happen? What are things we can do or things that need to happen inside a buyer organization for uh, f- in order to increase the likelihood of that kind of high quality, low regret purchase happening? And I won't, I've already banged on too long on this, but also, but here's the, here's the, the short answer is we've run everything. <laughs> Yeah. It seems like you name it, we've run it through that model, right? All the challenger attributes, all sorts of sales techniques, all sorts of uh, you know content attributes, marketing strategies, digital engagement, all of it. We've run everything through that model, it seems, or at least a lot. Mm-hmm. And by far, by far, which I know is a very technical research term, <laughs> the single biggest the single biggest driver of of the likelihood of a customer buying a high quality low regret deal, is something that we came to call decision confidence. And and just to break that down, and we can pull it apart if you want to go there, is essentially it's the degree to which customers across a range of dimensions report a high degree of confidence in themselves. Have do Are we confident we ask the right questions? Are we confident we've done sufficient research? Are we confident we even collectively agree on the problem we're trying to solve? If customers aren't confident in themselves across that range of dimensions, whether or not they believe your product, your feature set and your value proposition doesn't matter because ultimately what you got to solve for, to your point, is not them loving your product, it's them making a decision. Yeah. And and the, the driver of a decision is self-confidence. It isn't your amazing value. That That's, that's a that's down the road a little bit. So well, and, and to, that, to that point though, I'll piggyback off that. I've worked yeah. with a number of organizations that the seller has almost said like, the product is going to work no matter what, because it's going to make an improvement, but I have to get them to believe in that improvement so that they can ever see it happen. And so it's really coming down to yeah. like you're saying a, a one to three to 5% improvement. Great. We can make those, those things happen probably just off of, off of people and process, right. Yeah. In a lot of yeah. organizations, yeah. we don't need all the feature sets in order to get that ROI. Right. But I've got to get them to somehow feel confident in the decision you're making, which is your point. So how well, does- let, let me, let, let, Well, let yeah. me get your take on this, right? So the um, so this company I'm at it now, uh, mm-hmm. well, my, my current partners, employers, um, and, and just family is a company called Ecosystems. And they're great. Yeah. Co- it's a great company. Um, and we're, we're a SaaS company, uh, like every other company in the world, it seems. And we have a, a software platform that sits, um, that came out of the world of what's called value management, which is a world most people don't actually know a lot about. I frankly didn't know a lot about until I joined Eco. Um, mm-hmm. But basically, at the simplest and frankly unfair simplest version of the company, it's the business of value calculators. So if you want this really amazing, robust set of calculations that you can create with your customer collaboratively to help them understand the value of taking a certain action, the, the value of buying your solution, our platform will help you do that. But here's the thing. So so there, there's I, so there's my shameless plug. However, it's it. actually, now I'm going to flip it because I'm going to take that whole thing that I just described and throw it out the window because uh, in, in a way that I think is really important to understand because see if this ever happened to you, Tim. But the, um, there... <laughs> In a in a world where you sit down with your customers uh-huh. with a with a value calculator, we all do this, right? Whether you use a platform or use a spreadsheet or a heck, a whiteboard, right? We all have the ROI calculator, the lifetime value assessment, the total mm-hmm. cost of ownership, and we build out the business case for our solution and how much money we're going to make or save our customers. And maybe if you've got a little challenger sprinkled in there, you've challenged customers to think across this different set of dimensions. And so now you make the value calculation, but you put that whole calculation in front of them. And this is so maddening. I've been part of this conversation. I can't tell you how many times in my career where the customer looks at it and effectively agrees to the values like, oh yes, you can save us that money, but you know, what we really need to focus on is this, or I could totally see where that number is important, but you know, our numbers are all different or, you know, based on our data, or actually this has become more of a nice to have priority than a need to have, or maybe... Maybe we could do that, but we need to do that. You know, our timelines are changed. It's like, oh my God, it's so frustrating, right? Because they they look at you, you've shown the value, they believe the value, and they still don't buy. And so you think, well, what the bleep do I do now? So then we have this tendency to to double down on value. No, 
let me get oh, some yeah. raving fans and, and, and for the current customer an adoption report or some thought leadership or a white paper with evidence from five other companies have done this and the value that they've gotten from it. And we just keep doubling down on value, 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 helping our customers see the value. And and we keep running into this brick wall of, eh, it's like it's like death by meh. <laughs> it's, like, what, it's like, what do you do then, right? So I've got an explanation, but let me first ask you, have you seen this happen? Have you started in this movie? Because I've been at it many times. I've started in this movie many times. And I feel like you're just constantly beating on the logical side of somebody and saying, well, but it all makes sense. It all makes sense. And you almost, as you continue to push down that road, you push yeah. them away. I feel like it almost, as you start burying them with content and building the case so much, I, I think it of like, you've already got me, you've already sold me. Don't keep selling me like that, that yeah. saying that everyone talks about. When you push that hard, I feel like it just burns the trust and almost makes them feel worse. Uh, well, you know, hundred percent. So in many ways, yeah. it's like you had me, hello, I see the value of your solution. But mm -hmm. right. And, it's like, and so we have to solve for that, that, but right. And so, yeah. but so by the way, just here's another shameless plug. Not for me, my, my good friend, co-author Matt Dixon's got a new book out called the jolt effect. And he, he talks yeah. about a lot of this in some, some parallel ways. You should get him on your show. It's actually really interesting stuff. The uh, really interesting stuff, but here's it. Here's a parallel, but slightly different take on it, which is, I think what's ultimately going on here is if what we ultimately have to do based on all this research, all this data is solve, not so much for customers, confidence in us, but customers, confidence in themselves, Let's stop and think about for a minute. What does that value calculation do? So we built the business case for us. We've shown them the value of our solution. Nice. In other words, what we've done is we've built the value of us toolkit, right? And 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 it's like we're solving for the wrong problem because ultimately what you find is that when you when you start peeling back the onion and think, why are they looking at this valued calculation and saying yes, but it's because if you really start to root cause their objections or their concerns or their fears, it you realize as a buying group, I have a five, 10, 15 people that are involved in this B2B purchase, they're ultimately not really even aligned on what the heck they're trying to do in the first place, right? So, so if you think about sort of a purchase decision is having sort of a set of dimensions and in, in a hierarchy of dimensions, right? From outcomes, what are the strategic outcomes? What are we just trying to achieve as a company or as a business unit or as a function or whatever? So what are we trying to achieve? What are the specific practical tactics that allow us to achieve those strategic objectives? And then what are the metrics we're going to use to measure progress against those tactics? What are the targets we're going to set to know that when we've made, we've had success? And then what's the timeline along which we're going to do that? So objectives, uh, tactics, metrics, targets, timelines, and your customer buying group has got to be aligned at each one of those levels. And if they're not, then it doesn't matter what kind of calculation that you're, you put in front of them. You can say, look, I can save you a million dollars. Yes, but it's not aligned to this objective. Or yes, but we're actually, we we want to, uh, you know, we've got a different tactic that we're pursuing. Or yes, but that's the wrong metric. Or yes, no, your target's too low or too high. Or yes, that's, that's great, but the timeline's off. We, we want to do it in less time. And so mm -hmm. I think the better thing to do to help customers feel confident about value isn't to double down on value, is to help align them across those five dimensions, across objectives, tactics, metrics, targets, timelines. And they're going to need help doing that because there's 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 so many of them, again, 5, yeah. 10, 15, and, and there's so much information and there's so much complexity and there's so many alternatives that the best thing I think we can do, the most valuable thing we can do is not give them a calculation, but provide a framework. I call this frame making. Instead of being frame breaking, which is all challenger, this is like we live now in the world of frame making, which is how can mm -hmm. I take that very complex world of decisions across those five dimensions, all those stakeholders, and just kind of chalk the field or chalk the pitch, give them some guidance around. Here's the kinds of objectives that customers like you have concerned, you know, have, have considered. Here's the here's how they ultimately chose. Here's the questions they asked themselves to decide which of these objectives matter most. Now there's three ways you can get after that objective. Here's your here's some options for you based on other companies like you or based on some benchmark data. In other words, we're not saying, I don't know, what do you want to do or do whatever you want. We're helping guide them, nudge them, uh, steer them, fill them with confidence by taking this overwhelming set of options around objectives and then around tactics and around the metrics and so on and narrowing the field, but then giving them the opportunity to choose Socratically from their perspective, what they want to do, which are the objectives they believe in. And, and our job is really to facilitate alignment at each of those levels, such that then value isn't an input to customer confidence. Value, I think, is an output of customer confidence. Confidence. It's the result mm -hmm. that comes out. It kind of drops out as, of these five dimensions. You get them all aligned. And so click, 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 click in a line. 
And then, then the value, then we show a value calculation or a value calculator that is aligned to each one of those five things altogether. That's a value calculation someone can get behind. So that's a, that's a very different kind of world. It's a very different kind of selling, which is start with helping customers figure out just what the bleep are they even trying to do in the first place, as opposed to help customers see how much money you're going to make them next week on something they may or may not even care about. Or, or may or may not even be able to do, right? Because right. I think to totally. your point, that it can be a great idea. It can be an amazing, like, yes, I want to do that. I want to accomplish it. But then as you dive into the tactics and you dive into the people that are going to have to be involved, you find out, oh, I, I'd love to play this way, but I don't have the people on the field to play that, that type of sport. Totally. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you. So, so it's actually, I didn't get time yeah. today. So I got to do it probably tonight or tomorrow morning. I'm going to, uh, I got to film a couple more breakdown videos. So I do these weekly videos, put them on mm-hmm. LinkedIn and YouTube called Brent's Breakdown. The one this morning, as you mentioned, is on Cake Mix. If anyone's yeah. seen the, the, the episode 25, I think it is. But, but here's the one that I want to film next. I want to get your thoughts on this because here's where I think, particularly from a marketing perspective, things get really interesting. Because every time that we found one of these techniques or ideas in, in our research, whether it be challenger or sense making or buyer enablement, this idea of frame making, we almost always found it through the lens of sellers. Like here's the best way for sellers to engage customers. But almost inevitably, in fact, I would probably say inevitably, my first big question that came out of that is, how would you do that without sellers? In other words, what is the digital equivalent? How do I challenge on a website? How do I build, how do I, how do I do buyer enablement in a digital format? What is and so I think there's this really interesting question of what is the web experience? the online experience, the digital, let's call it the digital experience. What yeah. is the digital experience that that provides a framework within which customer stakeholders collectively can align around objectives and then tactics and the metrics and targets and timelines? And that has not come to our website, watch a raving fan video and then yeah. click this PDF. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's totally not. It's totally different, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? So my thing and, and coming from smaller organizations and then larger yeah. ones now, it's, it's a little different in how you can adopt it and buy into those organizations. But I still believe for me, it's like, I want to get in there and play around with it. Like right. if you look at yeah. open AI, like generative AI was never really known by anybody. And now it's like off to the, you know, it's, it's insanity right now. Yeah. I think the only reason why that worked is because if you put people in a sandbox and you let them play with it and let them be creative. It's like you were saying, Socratic, right? Yeah, like, right. I'm having fun. I'm getting creative. I may not even do something that's business value, but it gets my mind thinking, my ability to be human and kind of look at how can this fit into my organization? Yeah. Now I own it. And now I'm taking this and going, here's this cool thing that I figured out and found and understand back to my organization. It's what you said. It's like, yeah, the seller's not the the one that's the important one. It's It's the buyer. And so if I Agreed. have a confident right. building yeah. experience, I think that's what then gets reflected back. That's where, to me, it's not the case study on the website. It's the person that behind the case study would say to you, if you were looking to solve a problem, hey, this is what you should try and do. Here's how I've done it. And then it would be almost like a choose your own adventure. Like, yes. what, so, 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 you know, it's funny because in, in the marketing side, we've been talking digital experiences about interactivity for, I don't know, certainly prior pandemic, 2016, 15, maybe is when that term really started to come up and marketers started looking at how do I make my websites interactive? Mm-hmm. But I don't know that we really gave enough thought in the marketing side, particularly before the pandemic hit. And, and then we all got distracted, right? Which is, you know, like, okay, interactive around what, to what end you know what what ultimately are we trying to accomplish through that interactivity and so i think this becomes a really interesting thing so imagine a this is what i've got in my head so you yeah. tell me if i'm nuts all right but imagine I, I don't know and by the way i'm not a graphic guy so i don't know like i don't know what the ui of this looks like exactly but if you made me design it it'd be a disaster but the uh, but imagine a website where i could go either uh, uh, individually to your point or maybe yeah. even with colleagues what if the website became almost like a conference room within yep. which myself and my colleagues could interact with each other in the context of this digital framework. So let me back up. So we tend mm-hmm. to think of websites as a place, well, I don't know, irrespective of how we tend to think of websites, what websites yep. de facto are is a place for the consumption of content, right? Yeah. We go to websites, and pictures. Can, right? And we read or we watch a video, we consume information, we consume content. But we don't actually debate. We don't engage. We don't explore in the sense of like, maybe we click on another link and read another white paper. But that's not what I mean. So imagine if you went to a website and maybe I'm a chief 
uh, marketing officer and I'm trying to buy, uh, I don't know, like I'm marketing the latest in marketing automation with an AI support thing. And I'm thinking, well, like, I don't even want it's like, so I want to go, maybe yeah. I go to your website and and maybe the website, instead of saying, here's three videos, watch them, or here's a white paper, it says, actually, before you do anything, you might want to try and figure out what are you trying to do? Here's some options. You know, wondering what other companies like you are trying to do. Here's a click here to see what CTOs care about in this world. Click here to see what CMOs care about. Maybe there's a drop down menu. Maybe it's like, maybe I can now not just configure the, some. So a lot of websites have solution configurators. But yep. what if I, oh, this is cool. All right. I, now, 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 now I'm vibing. All right. So instead of having a solution configurator, what if I had an objective configurator and a tactics configurator and a metrics configurator? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So, so this, that, that, now that is cool, I think, right? Is And then is like, I configure what I'm trying to do as opposed to configuring what I'm trying to buy. And by configure, I mean, like literally, I'm not sure, is this the right thing I should even be doing? By the way, when I go to your website and all there's a bunch of freaking PDFs that I can download and two videos I can watch and it's not helpful to that, then I have, oh God, save me now. I got to go call a sales rep and pray to goodness that he yeah. or she can help me with that because the website <laughs> didn't. And by the way, they're not, they're going to pitch me on the freaking product. And now I'm sitting alone and I'm freaking frustrated and I don't know what to do. So never mind. I'll just study for six more months and, and, and I'll just have- hate my, and, I'll, and I won't hate you so much as I'll hate me. Do you see what I'm saying? This yeah. is humanity. It's the dark side of humanity, Tim. Oh my God. <laughs> but it is the dark side of trying to buy and understand software, like right? as just one segment, but I think it's across the board. Consumers, yeah. I think, have done a little bit better, right? I mean, even Costco Maybe. gave me free samples. Have you heard my Amazon riff? Uh, yes, we talked about that on our. Did on we our, tell you my Amazon riff? So here's it. But yeah. nothing gets the Amazon. But but I mean, in the consumer side, is really in fact, in some ways, the consumer side it plays out the same way, right? So it does. Here's the, here's the riff, right? So and this is a true story. I like to most of my stories are true, and this one actually mm-hmm. is. So the uh, so recently, I wanted to buy a. And sorry, I know you already heard this. We got to do this for the people, right? But the yes. remember the crystal. I'm, I'm a crystal ball. <laughs> um, but the, geez. but the um, I recently went to Amazon to buy a dongle. I, I just like to say the word dongle. So that makes the story mm-hmm. so much more fun to talk about. But the, uh, you know, like a $15 piece of cable that connects my laptop to uh, to a phone. Critical a piece phone. of software. Definitely takes a long right. time to right. yeah. But mm-hmm. oh my God, it's like, do I need USB mini? Do I use USB micro? Now there's USB C. Is it USB A? Is it backward compatible? What's it like? What's the capacity of it? Will, can, will it work in Europe? I don't, it's like, oh my God. So that's You're okay. So yourself. I, right, for, first of all, a little overwhelmed, but that's okay. Yeah. I'm just going to go. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Amazon or pick your platform. And I'm, they're going to search menu, of course. So I just yep. put in the, all the different attributes in the search menu and say, here's what I want. It's, and if you think, well, how hard could this be? It's a 15 freaking dollar. I made up the number, but it's probably about 15 bucks. It's a dongle. It's just yep. fun to say. It shouldn't be hard to buy. So I put all that in the search window and Amazon say, hey, I got your back. Here's 1,500 options. It's like, oh my God, 1,500 what now? How could there be $1,500? It's like, no, but that's okay because Amazon's got your back. So they play a little frame-making role. They play some guidance. They say, all right, here's Amazon's choice. Here's the here's the one that we think you should consider. Now, first of all, you're wondering about motives. Do, I was going to say, got, do you have right? Trust? Right, exactly. Do you have some sort of back end deal with them, or is it like true? Like, how is it this year for you? What are the criteria? Money on this one? Uh-huh. Right, exactly. Who? What are the criteria? That, but, but we'll just park that and go with faith for just a moment because yep. I got to start somewhere. There's fifteen hundred of them, so I might as well start with that one. So yeah. I click on it. And it's like, okay, it looks pretty good. It's got four point eight stars. It's got three thousand reviews. Everybody likes it. Okay, I'm about to press, you know, press go, press buy, and all of a sudden, like, you, then, then it happens. You know what? It, it's like you know it. Like it, it's going to happen. And sure enough you find right before you're about to buy the one star review, right? It's like, yep. hold on, wait a minute. This one person hated it. Oh crap. All right. So what, why did they hate it? All right. What's, oh, ooh, that actually is kind what of- What would motivate result. somebody to put a right. one star review? Right. It's like, that actually, you know, and I read this, it actually sounds like that could be, oh, here's another person. That, oh, so, so now you start like, you wobble a little bit, but that's okay. Because Amazon, with their help and frame makes it, but companies, customers bought this one, bought this one too, or here's other options like that. So, okay, maybe I'll go take a look at that one, right? And I go look at that one. It's got 4.78 stars, almost the same. That's great. Uh, it's got was Three hours later, I still haven't freaking bought a $15 dongle. And now mm-hmm. I'm getting really frustrated. I'm not mad at Amazon. I'm mad at myself for not being able to pull up and shoot and make what felt like a simple beeping decision so I can get back to doing whatever it is with my kids or whatever, right? And uh-huh. at that point, I'm just so frustrated. But Amazon's got my back because they've got a little button on their website that says save for later. And so that's what I do. I just click save for later. And you know, the joke ends and it's a true story that my wife 
my, my wife will, it's because we buy a lot from Amazon in this house, but the, uh, my wife has 586 items saved for later in her Amazon account, Tim. That's 586 purchase decisions. Like uh, these are low involvement consumer, yeah. you know, this is like towels or I don't know, I'm making stuff up now, but you know what I mean? It's not, it's not a C, uh, it's not a marketing automation system for six to seven figures that's going to span the globe. Like these are yeah. relatively simple things. Now project that into the world of our customers buying B2B solutions and and it's because we're still human beings. It's not like we stop being human when we go to work. Most of us don't stop being human when we yeah. go to work. But the uh, the the um, so that problem is just like just becomes magnified. And now not it's not just one person buying, but it's a group of people buying. It's yeah. kind of to me, Tim, sometimes amazing that commerce happens at all. Do you know what I mean? It, it's like, it is. And, and right now, with every single B two B website looking the same, right. How is and that the supposed same to help words? me? I mean, a Gartner exactly. report comes out. I hate to, I don't blame Gartner on this, but if a Gartner report comes out and in three weeks, I can almost bet the orchestra of who's going to change what messaging and when and how their message is going to change. You know, I was thinking about websites this morning as part of this breakdown video I want to do. do you, yeah. So you're, you're uh, well, you're not old enough to remember from experience, but you're old enough to know because you've like, you like, think about kitchens, yeah. right? If I were to show you five pictures or maybe four pictures of kitchens, you could probably roughly tell me the decade that they represent. You know what I mean? Like, right. Just so, the like, house. so yes, <laughs> there you go. Right. So you got a, you got an avocado green uh, or harvest gold refrigerator. I know you're yeah. talking the seventies with shag rug in the kitchen. Oh my God. Who thought Absolutely. that was a good idea? It's because everyone was doing drugs in the seventies, right? The eighties is like the linoleum tile. I mean, I was there, I lived through all this, right? At some point we all hit the granite stage where everything became granite yep. in the two thousands, right? And Tuscan, but, but, Tuscan right, anyway. <laughs> red cherry cabinet. That's really <laughs> funny. That's so true. Right now, everything's freaking white, man. It's just all yeah. white. And, I, and in fact, just recently I read like someone woke up and said, why are all our kitchens white? We need to stop the madness. So now I guess now we know what the 2020 kitchens will look like. But here's the thing. Here's the point I'm trying to make. It's the same thing with websites. Yeah. Right. I know there's, I could pull up a website and you could say, oh, that's a 2010 website, isn't it? Right. It's because they all go through this fashion and they all look the same. I've literally talked to marketers trying to figure out what to put on the website. Say, well, let's go look what other websites do and see what they do. And let's do that. It's like, how do we think this is a good idea? It's like, when it's like, why would it's like in, in trying so hard to differentiate your product, we create a commoditized digital experience. It's like, how did 100%. we think that was going to work, right? And yet, by the way, we do this not because we're dumb or idiots or lazy. It's just because it's, it's just because we don't know what else to do. And I think the thing to do right now in your digital experience, as well as your sales experience, human or digital channel, doesn't matter, become channel agnostic and all this stuff. So of your customers, by the way, mm-hmm. um, is to create an experience specifically designed to put a framework around a tough, complex decision such that you leave enough um, room for your customers to feel a sense of agency that they are ultimately deciding that it's their choice on objectives and tactics and metrics and targets and timelines, but you've chalked the pitch or the field in such a way that you've made it feel one, credible uh, and two, manageable and and make that interactive. It's like setting show up a web- the game board. Right. And show me a website that does that. Yeah, That's exactly. Yeah. Right? The but, best, but, by the way, someone might tell me, but, but the best sales reps do this already. It's like, I oh, no, that's the point, right? It's like, how do we get everyone else to do this? That's yeah, it. I was going to say, how do we elevate the second and third tier, right? Those that are right. really struggling or those that are not reaching quota, how do we get them up there? And then how do we do it without them at all? Yeah. I mean, 44% right? of millennials don't want to talk to sales. Oh, it's higher than that. The last, the last metrics we saw at Gartner right before I departed a year ago, right now, was the the new data had just rolled in as I was rolling out, but the um, uh, it made it in the last year's keynote, which I wrote but didn't deliver, and it was uh, I think it was seventy two percent of B two B buyers would prefer to buy a B two B solution, a complex B two B solution, without ever talking to a sales rep at all. And and what was interesting is the early data was the millennials in particular really don't want to talk to reps, but over time that data evened out. So even Xers, and I don't I, I, when we we hadn't got the Zers yet when I left, yeah. but the um but basically it was kind of across the board. Like nobody wants to talk to a sales rep. They do it only because they have to. And one of the reasons why they have to is because they're not getting what they need from digital. But effectively customers have become channel agnostic. Your sales reps are no longer the channel to your customer. They are a channel to your customer. And and that's true at any point in a buying journey of early, middle, or late. And so I think the better thing to think about is not so much what do I need to do to make my sellers better or what do I need to do to make my website better, but rather how can I, irrespective of a channel, human or digital, solve 
for customers' perceptions of themselves and their confidence that they're aligned around objectives, tactics, metrics, targets, and timelines. Full stop. Which takes me to one thing that I've been thinking about through this. Yeah. It's the hero's journey. And the yeah. one thing I've always gotten from the marketing side is, hey, we all say it. Doesn't mean it, it, it's true. And most of the time it's not. Oh, the customer is the hero. Yeah. You're but the, if we you're the did. you're the Obi Wan or you're the um I heard this just yesterday actually someone said yeah you're you're, um, you're, no, you're, you're the Gandalf you're yeah the yesterday Gandalf. I heard you're you're the Gandalf is what I heard yesterday yeah. yeah yeah and I'm thinking that's an interesting thing but so hard to do because think who those characters are in those stories that means we've got to elevate the hell out of our people mm. or out of our brand to actually fill the role of Gandalf or Yoda or whoever you want to put up there. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it's scary do we do? too. We put a 24 year old BDR in front of them. But can we also just take a moment to appreciate the fact that Gandalf, Yoda, and Obi Wan all die <laughs> in the process of uh, helping the hero save the day, right? They, they sacrifice themselves and literally lay down their lives to, to, to play that supporting role. Um, I'd prefer to get paid than lay down my life. So, but, but, uh, but, 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 but notice, but see, this is really interesting. So um, there's, there's a company called Expedient. They're in the cloud computing business. It's a really smart company. And the CEO I for, uh, is a guy named Brian Smith. Mm -hmm. I first got to know Brian with a Y, by the way, in case anyone cares to look him up. He's an amazing guy. I first got to know Brian when he's head of sales. He got promoted to head of strategy. Now he's, head, you know, he's the CEO. Brian is one of the smartest commercial leaders I've ever met. He's brilliant. He's also a Midwesterner. So he's a humble, you know, just mellow, cool dude. Yeah. And um, I, a few years ago, it was prior to pandemic, right before the pandemic, I, I did his sales kickoff. I presented it to his sales team at his kickoff. And uh, we were talking about the sense making work that showed up in HBR and, and, you know, we did it, Gartner. And the, um, and, and, the, and many of the themes are exactly what we're talking about today, helping customers feel more confident in their own ability to make decisions on behalf of their company. And, and he said something, Tim, at the end of that conversation to his entire sales team that, that echoes this Yoda point, which I thought was really interesting. He said, he said, our job, and he's looking at his, his quota carrying sales force when he says this. He says, our job is to help our customers make the best decision they can in as little time as possible. That's it. That's all I want you to do. I want you to go out in the field, work with customers, and your job is just to help them make the best decision that they can in as little time as possible. So, and his point was, our role isn't to get them to buy our stuff. Our yeah. role is to make them feel good about themselves and their ability to make the right decision. And he said, sometimes that decision won't be for us. He said, that's why I want you to help them do that in as little time as possible. This is the whole thing about sales. If you're going to lose, lose early, right? Because sometimes yeah. we're not the right answer, but I don't care if we're the right, it, obviously he cares that they're the right answer. He says, mm -hmm. irrespective, that's a better way, irrespective whether we're the right answer or not for that customer at that moment, what I want that customer walking away with is a feeling like those guys at Expedient, that team at Expedient, man, they get me, they help me. And every time I interact with them, I feel better about myself. So the next time that customer's got a need, you know who they're going to call? They're going to call Expedient. Every and time. that's every time, right? Every time. And this is, as you and I talked about this a little bit in the prep yeah. call, but this is kind of what human relations are, you know, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a, a marriage, whether it's just like high school dating, it's all the yeah. same. We're all human beings, right? Which is we, we tend to, most of us in general, tend to gravitate to people, not so much that we love, but people who, when we're around them, allow us to love ourselves. Do you know what I mean? Unless uh -huh. like there's, there's a lot of dysfunction in the world. So that's not always true. But I think those relationships that really make you, that, that you think you're your best friend, or you know, if you've got a really healthy marriage or whatever it might be, you think, I love that person. But what we're really saying is, I love me because when, of that person. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh -huh, and, totally. and we don't, we don't really talk like that, but that's kind of what's going on. That's the physics of this in a lot of ways. And there's more oh. to it than I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but, but I love that part of the relationship story because that ports directly over to B2B commerce. Customers will tend, and, and Robert Cialdini talks about this in this, yeah. you know, the canonical book influence. Yep. It's called a, it's called a, 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 a value exchange, which is effectively and it's, it's all this stuff happens at sort of the subconscious level, right? But effectively, I will pay you, Tim, with my business for you helping me feel better about myself. 
Right? 100%. Now, no no one says that out loud, but yeah. that's kind of what happens, right? Help me sleep yeah. at night. Yeah. It's yeah. it's so human, isn't it? It's like we get so wrapped around the axe about the physics of selling and buying. And really what we're talking about so deep down in all of this is just human beings just schlubbing their way through life and trying to like just get up another day and feel good about it. <laughs> it's you're spot on. It, because at the end of the day, it's people buy from people, right? And And we all have work life. And then we want to be able to shut it off and go home. Like I, I remember a deal that that somebody it was telling me about and they said, you know, the only reason why that person bought the deal is because I made one commitment to them. You will be home by 5 PM to kiss your wife on the head and have dinner. And you haven't oh. done that for the last nine months. Yeah. And you that's know, why they, that's why they, it's, 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 there's, there's one caveat to that, which is, is more, more of an extension. Yeah. Um, and actually, this it has to be challenger. the right solution, of course. Well, you know, they're all that's true, but actually, yeah. this one's a little bit different. This actually, I buried it in the Challenger customer somewhere. I have no idea where, but the um, it while it is absolutely true that companies don't buy things, but people, it's people that do. So it's not so much yeah. B to B, but B to P. In fact, some yeah. so the CEO at Xerox a number of years ago used to call this B to P sales, which is business to people. Mm -hmm. But um, the caveat or the extension that would be, well, it may be true that it's not companies that at the end of the day that buy things, but people that do. In business to business, it is equally true that it's not people that buy things, but groups of them that do. Yes. And, and that changes, again, the physics, I think, really, really dramatically, because now it's not just my decision to spend seven figures on this IT solution. It's 15 of us across different you know, different uh, functions and different geographies and different levels. And I've got my credibility on the line and we're all tired and I kind of don't like three of them. And frankly, two of them don't like me. And oh, by the way, my job's on the line. And to your point, I haven't been home because I've been working God knows 80 hour weeks, although I work from home. So now I'm just in my office all the time, whatever it is, right? It's like, yep, yep. It's, just, it's just a mess. It's just so it messy. And when, you know, I, I've done this exercise where I, I've gone around the world back in the traveling days. And I, I used to, and this is back before it got really complicated, but I, I used to ask, you know, commercial leaders, because that's who I used to present to. It's let's do a, an exercise in empathy. I want you to take your sales hat off, your marketing hat off and put your buying hat on. And I want you to think about it from in your own company with your colleagues. Think about a purchase that you've made together on behalf of your company. Maybe it's capital equipment, a consulting engagement, you know, a business service, you know, a six, seven figure, a big complex deal. Think about all the people that were involved. Think about the stages you had to go through. Think all the decisions you had to make now. If I were to ask you one word, one adjective to describe that entire experience, what would that word be? And Tim, I've quite literally asked thousands of people this question, and I've yet to hear a single positive word. It's always no. long, painful. hard, frustrating, cluster. awful, painful, cluster. I have heard cluster. Someone actually managed to slip an F-bomb into a yep. word cloud we did in front of a thousand people at a Gartner at a CEB conference back in the day. <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, and, you know, and, and, and someone once said landmine and I said, that's not an adjective. And he said landmine ish. Right. And so <laughs> but B2B has become landmine ish. Right. Yeah. And, and that this is the, it's not, it's not people that buy things, but groups of them that do mm -hmm. it's exhausting people. It's like, it's like, I, the, like, there's a CMO who answered this question in Chicago. You know what her word was, Tim, her word, quite literally her word was, I never want to do that again. All one word, all slammed together. And you could like viscerally see the pain in her eyes. Uh -huh. She was like reliving. I think it was a CRM purchase. God, what a surprise. Oh, yeah. right? She was having right? flashbacks. Oh, she was in the moment. You could see <laughs> her reliving. Yes, right? It's like, I never want to do that again. And which always leads me to ask people, what do you do when the first word your customer thinks of, not in buying your solution, yeah. but a solution like yours? This isn't about you and your customer experience and fix your CX and streamline, you know, and, and just, you know, level out the touch points and make it an effortless experience. All that stuff's important, but that's not what this is, right? Because mm -hmm. this is customers not thinking about buying from you. This is about customers thinking about buying. And yeah. their first word they think about is, I never want to do that again. This is, again, I'll come back to it. It's kind of amazing to me that commerce still happens at all. And it still happens, of course, because it has to happen. But, yeah. but, but, but what if you were the one person or the one digital experience that effectively showed up and said, you know what, let's see if I can help you make this a little easier. Let, let me, it's not, it's, it won't be that bad. Let me guide you through this. Let me yeah. help you feel more confident in yourself and your group as your team and the decision you make. That's what we all want to do. I think, you know, it, it's hard to argue that point, but the way we go about it is like, okay, and the way I'm going to do that, is show you the value calculator that shows you how much money I'm going to save you next month. It's like, oh my God, you had me at hello. And then you went there. It's like, anyway, there you go. Well, exactly. Because also in the same thing, you've got a seller that's going, my sales process 
and they're looking at it as a checklist. They're not looking at it as, oh, these are the chapters I need to walk through with my buyer and the experiences we need to have to grow and and get to the point where you have enough confidence and you're ready to buy. Now we're full circle back to the very beginning of the conversation, which you asked me, it's like the biggest opportunity is like, we are all our own worst enemy, right? Our, Our processes, our metrics, our quarterly goals, our desire to, you know, to maximize shareholder value. I mean, all these things are, they're done with good intentions, but they all collectively in aggregate have this really weird side effect of actually making things worse. Because ultimately, again, we're solving, because what we need to solve for is making money, not to be crass, we're businesses, right? We have to solve for a quarterly goal and shareholder value. And so it just, that all of those objectives for us automatically force us into this myopic inward looking view. How do we make more money for us? How do we sell more of our product? Right. And, and funny enough, the thing is, it just feels like almost like a trust fall. The best way to get those outcomes for you is to solve for the customer's outcomes for them. And that, that just like feels very uncomfortable for a lot of us, I think. Yeah. I, it it feels like you're giving away control, right? And nobody wants to hand away control. Yeah. Heck no. Heck no. Kidding me? Yeah. I'd, I mean, I'd say some something Tesla else, but drivers. I'm not from <laughs> I know some Tesla drivers that are ready to, to give away control, right? <laughs> oh, the joke about, we know how that goes, but we won't make that joke. We I think it just there. did, but the, uh, anyway, yeah, I don't know, but I don't know if we've solved the world's problems, but I, but I, I do think, you know, th- th- there's such everybody in B2B is trying to answer the same question beyond sort of how do we sell more stuff, mm-hmm. which is how do we stand out? How do we differentiate? And we tried to differentiate on products and we all got commoditized. And we tried to differentiate on solutions and we all got commoditized. And we tried to differentiate on thought leadership and then everyone started saying really smart things and our thought leadership got commoditized. I think right now, the biggest window of opportunity for differentiation to stand out is to be the one company digitally or in person that shows up and helps customers feel more confident themselves. I love that. that that's the mic drop moment right there. And I think it's a, it's a very different way of looking at it. Yeah. In an environment where I've always said marketing ruins everything, but marketing and sales right now ruins everything because we're in an arms race. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, you know, with, with my last question I was going to pull up to is like, yeah, AI, AI and all this Jeez. stuff right now, like, again, we go back to this. It's great for the seller. It's great yeah. if I just had to write a sequence of emails and send out a thousand blasts and hit my activities. Yeah. Do you think any of this stuff's great for the buyer? Well, it could be, right? Could be. <laughs> I mean, be. any of this stuff could be. Marketing automation could have been good for the buyer. Heck, uh, Scott Gillum, my good buddy, wrote sure. today about ABM, and he said ABM was supposed to be good for the buyer. We all know how that worked yeah. out, right? Because it all turns into activity-driven, because it's basically yeah. these days it's activity-based marketing, not account-based marketing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, on this note, so so I've actually written about this a little bit. So um, on the uh, standing on the shoulders of uh, of, of uh, a good friend and uh, Howard Dover. So Howard Dover mm-hmm. is a professor of sales at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, he's got one of the best sales programs in the world, literally. Um, and he just published a book called The Sales Innovation Paradox. And and why I say I I came on the journey because he, he let me write the foreword um, of the book. <laughs> and I opened the forward with um, with you're too young, but the uh, the the final scene of the 1970s classic, The Planet of the Apes, is the original with Charlton Heston. And the uh, mm-hmm. I I, I kind of want to tell you about it, but then it would spoil the whole ending. So, but the but basically, it's like everything is doomed to become the last scene of The Planet of the Apes, which is just another way of saying this is why we can't have nice things because what'll happen is we take a something potentially really cool like AI. Yeah. And and we'll take it, boil it down to its most basic element and then turn it into an activity-driven thing. And all of a sudden just spam the, it's like one more tool to spam the world Yes. with, you know, it's like, oh, it's so, so could it be great? Yes. Will it be great? I have, I, unlikely, you know, it's just, uh, there, that's, by the way, this is specifically in sales. There's a whole other question about what AI is going to do. Oh yeah. Rewrite. Amazing capabilities, like, but in sales. And, and yeah, exactly. And, and will it actually lead to. You know, what's that moment when when machines become self-aware? That's the uh not the inception, that the um oh there's a name for that. They oh the um 
I lost it. It'll come back to me. You don't read enough science fiction, clearly, Tim. You know, no, I don't. Exactly what I'm it's, it's a, there's I grew this moment. up on Star Trek and some of those things, and I, I can reflect with my father yeah. as, as he watches some of the stuff in today. And goes, as soon oh as God, we, as soon as life. we hang up, it's going to come to me. And there's at least one person listening to this. All you know, the four people listening to, it, including my mom. Hi, mom. Uh, or you know, like <laughs> one of them is going to say, "It was like uh, it's going to know what I'm talking about." But there's um. It, but but you know then all bets are off you know like yeah. when the machines rule the earth god knows but but for sales i think what'll happen is we'll take this we'll see it as a means for scaling right and mm-hmm. so we will we will scale we'll continue not start we'll continue to scale mediocrity that's what we do that's what we do in sales we we say we want to scale quality and so we try to capture quality in a bottle and we scale that but the thing we capture in a bottle is always the light version and ultimately mediocre and just by scaling it we make it that much worse well, absolutely. We just make it vanilla. Yeah. yeah. And it becomes commoditized. Even as great as this is why people get really frustrated with, you know, when they look over the arc of my career, it's like, I thought you said challenger wins. Now you're saying it doesn't. It's like, first of all, I didn't say it doesn't win. I was, I'm not sure you even said it does. It's a probability game, but it's a, con- it's a constantly moving target. That's the point, yeah. right? It's you have to keep studying this stuff because selling keeps changing and more importantly, buying keeps changing. And that's because the world keeps changing. The things like information, the amount and the quality of information available to customers is radically different today than in 2009 when we first wrote a book about challenging with commercial insight. So it's a, it's just, it's the, the, the playing field is different and it will oh, continue totally. to evolve. Like yeah. how we're talking about interactive websites. If you said that 10 right. years ago, 15 years ago, you'd be like, wait, no what? way. I mean, even <laughs> still today, it's like build the UI and go down the happy path. And like, let's please not go off into the sides of the forest. Yeah. yeah. So what's yeah. on your mind? What's, as you think, put it all together. It's like, what's, what's the, what's the big opportunity, the big challenge that you think is in front I think of you? I think you hit it on the head with, um, with trust. I think when I look at how a seller could win in today's market, I think it's mm-hmm. more conversations and more understanding and consulting and working together. I think it's yeah. somebody sitting in the room or, or over a Zoom and saying like, no, let's actually map out what a campaign would look like in marketing automation for you if you had this tool. Or how would you want it to function? Let me show you how. Yeah. I think it's that type of a sales process now where you're going to have to have somebody that's really good on the relationship side and really good on the human element of selling and building trust, but also they're going to have to have this like kind of creative builder, interesting, almost sales engineer, but not as not just dry and technical. Like, I think that's what people really want. I think you're right. You you know, that I guess the the last thing I'd say about trust is the, uh, because, because again, it's like, oh, it's, it's hard to argue. And it sounds so obvious when you hear it, but Mm -hmm. the way we, and I'm just belaboring the same point over again. So I'll just briefly, but uh, I, I want my customer to trust me. So therefore I will show my credentials. I will talk about all the kinds of customers that I worked with. I will t- I will show them the the testimonials from other companies. I will show them your calculator. Again, what we solve for with trust nine times out of nine is customers trust in us. And I'd yeah. love to see that one sales professional who decides to solve for customers trust in themselves. And again, the same thing works in, I think it's just human relationships. It's like if, the, the, someone told me when I was just very, very young, said, if you want to make friends, the best way to make friends is to get someone talking about themselves, right? This is to put mm-hmm. all the focus on them, which is ironic given this podcast. And I think I've let you say three words. Right? So clearly we're not friends, Tim. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, but the, the, there's just such a powerful moment of you being a catalyst for changing someone else's self-perception as uh-huh. opposed to changing their perception of you. It's, it's lifting other people up, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's helping them. I mean, I, I go back to, I love skiing, avid skier. It's been snowing a lot this year. The, yeah, the days you places, have the, yeah. in some places, the days you have the most fun or when you're yeah. with a buddy or somebody else that pushes you to go a little bit beyond or, or to yeah. try something a little different and be your best. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, we don't do that. You're right. We come yeah. up and it's all about me selling my product and you buying it. To be fair though, like if so, if you oh. make this your life, if you make this your life mission mm-hmm. to I'm going to be a force for good and everyone I'm going to encounter professionally and personally, my goal is to get them to feel better about themselves. That's an amazing goal. And you know what else it yeah. is? It's unbelievably exhausting, right? Oh, it is. It's just, and at some point, you need to flip roles and find someone to fill your cup. Do you know what I mean? To find someone like you need to feed off the energy of others because otherwise you just burn out. You're like this flash of brilliance across the sky 
and you can't sustain it. So True. that's a whole nother podcast for another time, but I, but I, it, it's duly noted. Let's just put a pin in that one, which is, but, but that's, but that is it, right? It's like, how can I become the force for good? And you're trying to lifting others up. It's the, it's when people encounter me, how do I create an encounter and experience such that when they depart that encounter, they feel better about themselves? Yeah. And, and I think what you said has nothing in con, like comparably what you told them, what you said, what they learned has nothing to do with, but other than like what you made them feel. Cause we yeah. remember how we felt. We don't remember what we talked that's about. Right. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we came on this call and I'm like the last time I was so excited to come on this call. I remembered a few things we talked about. I had some notes, but I thoroughly just enjoyed the energy in the conversation. And this time you're thinking, what was I thinking? This wasn't anything like I thought. <laughs> so if anybody is crazy enough out there to want to get in touch with Brent, Brent, where can they reach you? How can they get in touch? Uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, which is where I yep. uh, post these breakdown videos on Thursdays usually. Uh, so the company ecosystems post them on their LinkedIn as well. We put them all on YouTube. You can find them all on YouTube there. Um, we actually run a, 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 a very rapidly growing, it's about 18, actually we just hit 2000 just yesterday. That's right. Wow. Um 2,000 members of a community of value people engaged in this value profession, whether they're value management professionals or sellers or customer success execs involved in it. And that's uh, on our website at ecosystems.io under under the resources tab, because everything's under the resources tab, right? You know how marketing works. Uh -huh. but the, uh, oh, of course. Um, <laughs> but, uh, or just reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn. It's probably the easiest way to find me. Uh, and I'm always happy to, to engage. And, you know, I speak at sales kickoffs and bar mitzvahs and birthday parties and, and you know. Greek Easter, cool that's coming up. I just got to make sure. Yeah, do it. What's that? Greek Easter. You'll speak there too. Greek. E <laughs> it's, that's Greek to me. No, it's, but uh, I don't know that I, as long as it's in English, the, uh, the I'm go. fluent in German, but I could never do a challenger keynote in German, for example, because that's, by the way, do you know how you say challenger in German? It's challenger. It's really funny. But, but the, um, the original, I got to tell you this last story that we probably yeah. should go with the, the, the very first translation of the challenger sale into German, um, was really funny. I actually got it on the shelf over here, but the, it's that white book behind me, but the, um, um, Whoever translated it wasn't, I don't think, a native speaker of German or wasn't a fluent speaker of English. What, what, there's something got lost in translation, but you may, I don't know if you know the book well, but there's these five uh -huh. profiles. We're talking about the challenger, the hard worker, and so on. And there's a profile called the lone wolf, and they translated it as der einsame wolf, which doesn't mean the lone wolf. It means the lonely wolf. And I've always oh. thought that was hysterically fun. It's like, <laughs> I always imagine it's like this, this seller out there just Sad and kind of lonely and sad. <laughs> My pack went <laughs> away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, so there you go. There's oh, that's good. Well, yeah. lots, a lot of things are lost in translation these days. So that's right. Including human relations. Go out there and help your yeah. customers feel better about themselves. That's it. Boom. Absolutely. Well, hey, All right, Brent, Tim. thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a journey to be on this and a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of good <laughs> knowledge here. So thank you. Cheers, man. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.